sitting on board El Gecko in Culebra in the Spanish Virgin Islands here in the Caribbean with our family and an old, old friend, Bill Pinkney. Bill and I go back many, many decades. I'm afraid to date ourselves, Bill. That's how far back you and I go. Well, well first of all, I'm not an old friend of yours. We are friends of long standing. Neither one of us are old. <laughs> good, good, good. Well, I'm glad somebody's got that right. <laughs> so, Bill, sort of fair. Uh, uh, do you remember the phone call you got from Mark Schrader? I remember that. I was living in uh, living in Chicago, and uh, Mark called me up, says, "Hey, Bill, I got this this young guy from South Africa that's trying to raise money to go on the around the world race, and uh, and I think you should talk to him." I said, "Okay, fine." And so Neil gets on the phone, and we talk a little bit. And about this was Sarah. around uh, 19, uh, ni 1988, uh, the Long Beach Boat Show in uh, Long Beach, uh, Southern California, that I had just met Mark Schrader. Yeah, so, oh, and, and Mark, of course, was uh, the, the American who has sailed uh, twice around raced, the world. Raced twice around the world. Right, once on a 40-foot Valiant and then on a 47-foot Valiant. So, uh, and that 47-foot Valiant actually became your boat. It was a boat that I ultimately took around the world. and. But this is the first time I met you, and we were talking, on it, and you said, oh, hey, I've got this bus pass that can take me anywhere in the U.S. I want to go in the next 30 days. I said, well, if you come to Chicago, come around this way, drop by and see me. Sure enough, he shows up. <laughs> Never invite me if you don't mean it, because I probably will show up. <laughs> so I traveled over to Chicago to go and see Bill. And Bill, at the time, sort of, uh, you were working on, on your dream. I was working on my dream to sail, sail solo around the world as a project uh, for my grandkids and for kids in the Chicago public school system uh, to learn about commitment, education, uh, the use of math, science, social studies, and how the things work in the real world and that you can make dreams come true. And so, Bill, you had a huge impact on my life because it was between sort of a um, mock and the old BOC challenge, the BOC of solo around the world race. That became my dream, my goal, and a very powerful cornerstone of that race and Mark Schrader was to link education and what children are learning in the classrooms around the globe to the adventurer, to the professional adventurer. And I was inspired by Richard Broadhead, the very first single-handed sailor. He finished, he finished third in the, uh, in the uh, uh, first uh, single-handed around the world yacht race. So out of that, both Bill's education program and the Around Loan program was, was built, but you really had a huge impact. You shared your curriculum with me as us planning, how, how was I going to pull this together? <laughs> Well, you know, the whole idea was that, that uh, here are two guys uh, who would come from beginnings that everybody would have said we were losers. We were, we were, according to statistics, losers. You in South Africa with apartheid and, and, and your own physical problems and so many things, me growing up on the south side of Chicago, going to a school system that was supposed to be the worst in the world. Statistically, we're supposed to be losers, but the big thing about it is that you and I never believed it. And that's the important that's thing. That's right. And that in part of that important element, there were people in your life that inspired you. Yeah. It was like, in my, in my case, my mother. My mother would never allow me to feel sorry for myself. Who was your inspiration? Who was the person who said to you, you could do anything? Same one. My mother. My mother told me, boy, anything you want to do, you can do. But you better work at it. That's right. Nobody Otherwise. owes you anything. And that's that's the thing that I kept with me so long. And nobody gave us anything. So that, uh, everything we had, we had to fight for every inch of the way. You went on and became uh, an executive in an era when uh, not many women, uh, not many men, uh, all women, <laughs> really women. In, in, in that year made into the executive team. But you made into the executive team. Yeah, with Fortune 500 company. I was uh, one of the first black marketing executives for Revlon, which is you know, it's a very big international company. So that was that was the step forward, and from that things led on and on and on until until ultimately I decided that I was going to make my dream a reality and, and show other people they could do it too. And a lot of people thought that both Bill and I, as two crazy dreamers, <laughs> that we would never have a chance. But somehow we found a way. At the time that I met Bill, I was busy building what was then named to, to be named Stella R. And Bill ended up with uh, Mark Schrader's uh, Valiant 47 uh, that he had raced around the world. And now Bill was about to take that boat around the world, departing from Chicago. Yeah, I went to Chicago. I was raising money in Chicago. Uh, matter of fact, it was interesting. I got Mark uh, and his group who owned the boat to let me bring the boat from Annapolis to Chicago on $20,000 cash. We're talking about a quarter million dollar boat. 
they believed enough in me to let me bring the vote to Chicago so I could raise money because nobody wants to give money to someone that can't show anything. You say, I'm going to sail around the world. And the guy said, where's your boat? <laughs> they have no vote, but they let me do that. And there are so many dreamers who talk about it and never really do yeah. it. And it's interesting, both you and I, uh, I found out that if you tell your dream to enough people, somebody's going to believe in your dream if you believe in it, That's right. and they're, they're going to help you. And you don't know where they're going to come from, so tell everybody. Exactly, exactly. So Bill ended up uh, back in, uh, sort of, I guess it was uh, early 1990 that you left, or some point in 1990, you set sail on your 27,000 mile following a similar route of the solo around the world uh, yacht race. Yep, I started off uh, from, actually I went to Boston, that's where my final uh, supporters came from, they were from Boston, and uh, I left Boston, I sailed Boston, Bermuda, Salvador Bahia, Cape Town, South Africa, Hobart, Tasmania, Punta del Este, Uruguay, Brazil, back to, bon bon, uh, back to uh, Boston. But the important thing is that we made a promise yep. when we met that we were going to meet in Cape Town when I got there. And so I just, uh, I flew back, I sort of uh, was able to finish my, my 38 footer and Bill had already set sail from uh, Brazil coming across the, at the Atlantic Ocean and we had been in touch and we arranged a rendezvous in Table Bay, under the foot of Table Mountain, but in the lee of Robben Island. This was a significant moment for Bill and I because Nelson Mandela had been a prisoner for over 27 years on Robben Island. And so our agreement was to meet off Robben Island. Bill was working towards becoming the first black man to sail solo around the world. And my goal was to race solo around the world, which brought me ultimately into the history books as being the first black man to race solo around the world. So our ties to Africa and our ties to South Africa were pretty critical. Yeah, because it, uh, I had gone through uh, what you were going through uh, with segregation in the U.S. And now I'm coming back to South Africa where that same system is in play. And for both of us to stand on our dreams and face and tell the world, hey, we can make it. This whole thing on both sides is ridiculous. And I, we had our idea to be able to make a mark and to make that statement, because it was a very important statement to make. And so I and my family sailed out into Table Bay. Bill was coming in single-handed. Bill was flying a spinnaker, sort of the, the and I vividly remember sort of like <laughs> the colors of the spinnaker. Yeah, the red, black, and green, the, uh, the African, uh, the, the black American liberation colors. We, and it made especially for that purpose, just to sail in the Cape Town. And so we arrived in, we arrived together in Table Bay, escorted Bill into Cape Town. Bill ended up spending some time in Cape Town with our family and then sailed on to continue and complete his circumnavigation of the globe. Somewhere around uh, 1991, I think you finished. 92, I 92. finished in uh, June 92. So Bill, sort of, so after, after your round the world race, uh, your round the world sail, I ended up sailing off to Europe. Uh, to enter the O-Star race and ultimately enter the BOC Challenge, the Solo Around the World race. But what, what did you do with your life in the years that followed? You and I touched base, uh, you came to, uh, to Charleston, South Carolina to, to support me and to work with me on the, on the sort of Around the World, my, my 1994 Around the World race and then you again, after I'd been dismastered and Harry Mitchell had died in the Southern Ocean, you again went to Uruguay to meet me and to join me. So we've touched, touched, base, uh, touched bases over many, many years in many different uh, ports. But you went on to do some pretty amazing things after your race. Let's talk about some of those things, including the Amistad. Well, right after the uh, the, uh, the race, of course, uh, before your race and after my solo circumnavigation, I, I wrote a kid's book uh, for children, first graders, a reading primer. And it's called? It's called uh, Captain Bill Pinckney's Journey, an original mm -hmm. title. Uh, and it was published by McGraw-Hill as part of their Basil Reading Program. And that was in 1994 it was published. It is still used in schools today, and I still get letters from kids who have read the book and want to, and want to write me letters. First graders, they write really great letters. And uh, that was it. <clears throat> I also had the opportunity to travel around the country to those schools and talk to young people about Commitment about education about and dreams. Your boat, and your boat was actually named commitment. It was named commitment. That was the name that I chose for the boat because that's what it takes on anything you're going to do. You have to make a commitment, and a commitment means a promise to yourself that you're going to do whatever, whatever. it takes. Exactly. Yes. And so, so the, the the impact again that a voyage, a sail, 
a adventure was not just about an indulgence of two single-handed sailors doing things that they believed in. It was about also sharing and impacting our communities and working on what I do is it right for myself, what I do is it right for my family. We all can answer that. But what I do is it right for my community. Bill and I are part of an amazing sailing community and a part of a global community as well as what can we do that impacts the next generation. And so I am in some many ways the generation that followed you. You had <laughs> impacted my generation through education, you had impacted me through education and passed on certain values. Let's talk a bit about the values that we have learned as single-handed sailors. And I want to open up with a comment that the sea doesn't care whether you are black or white, American or South African, rich or poor. It will make you equally as wet and if you are not paying attention, it will take your life like that. It, it is totally a level, level playing field. It is totally indiscriminate of who you are. And no matter what you have, and that's one of the things that I, I always try to tell people, you have to be prepared just like life. If you're prepared, then your chances of survival are great. If you're not prepared, you haven't got much of a chance. The sea will prove that. Life will prove that. And that's one of the things that both of us have, have been able to find out, is preparation, desire, and perseverance. Perseverance is so, so important. I find now that a lot of young people will try something once and say, oh, I can't do that, and walk away. Mm -hmm. And we lose not only their potential, but they lose their potential as well. And uh, that's important. Well, it also comes down to uh, a mother hen. Yeah. Uh, when a, a young, young chick is in the eggshell and stunned to hatch, this chick starts to fight his way or her way out of that eggshell. But if mother hen picks open the eggshell, the chick is doomed. And sadly, I think our society is dooming the next generation by making things too easy, by making excuses, by giving them things versus allowing them to earn the things that they really need. To sail around the world is not something that gives it to you. You earn the right to survive. That's a great, I, I love that analogy. They have to peck their way out of the shell. No one can peck their way out for them. It is so important. Uh, that, that people, and young people particularly, learn that and, and find out about it. Uh, we are so blessed at this point in time with, with the technology, with the opportunities, and with the things uh, that we have available. But the, the thing about it is, no one's going to hand it to you. No one owes it to you. You have to go out there and get it. And I think that's one of the things that, that we want to impress on young people. And on, on adults as well. You know, we, we're talking about young people. We're talking about adults. So many adults just give up. Mm -hmm. Give up. Things don't go right the first time. They say that's it. But again, you have to keep at it. If you keep at it, you try different methods, different methods of, of doing things, different approaches toward life, and you'll find it, that somewhere there is a way. That's right. And you just have to be willing to go after it. So, Bill, you are 70 plus years. 78. 78 years of age. Yeah. You have been an executive. You've been a dreamer and adventurer. <laughs> you are now a single-handed around the world sailor. You are a Cape Horner. Uh, but you never just sat back. You never said, you know what, I've done it. I've, I've arrived. You continue to build. You continue to elevate. You continue to look for the next plateau. Tell me about the Amistad. Well, the Amistad, that's an incredible story because the Amistad is the first human rights case in the United States Supreme Court. People don't really realize that. It's used in many law schools as a case in point about human rights because it was a case where 53 Africans stolen from Africa. And I say stolen because in 1839 when it happened, it was against the law. Slavery was law. illegal. Slavery was legal. The transportation and capturing of slaves in West Africa was, was illegal. These people were caught in West Africa illegally, transported illegally, and sold illegally into slavery. They were never born slaves. <clears throat> they took over the ship, the Amistad, which was a was a, not a slave ship, but a, just a, a coastal schooner that they were going from one part of Cuba to the other to go to, to work in the fields, took over the ship, tried to sail it back to West Africa because they weren't sailors. They ended up being, being caught by the Gulf Stream up the East Coast into Connecticut where they were arrested, charged with murder and piracy, stealing the boat and killing the captain. Their case went through the U.S. Supreme, up through the U.S. Supreme Court, supported by John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States, who argued the court, the court case in the Supreme Court for nine hours and won the case 
not based on slavery laws, not based on, on civil rights laws, but based on human rights. It is an important situation to remember that it's about human rights, a right that we all have being born as humans. The scary thing about this is that today, this year, 2014, there are more people in slavery now than there have ever been. Yes, and now we are not just talking about uh, sexual slavery of, of women and, and children. We are talking about economic slavery as well. Yes, and emotional slavery emotional. as well. Certainly. Psychological slavery that, that are held, uh, held over people who are held as despots in, 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 many, in many countries and nations that, that uh, they have no hope for any future. They are being controlled and held against their will which and is working in, working in sweatshops working under appalling conditions around the globe making cheap product so that we in the united states can have yeah. cheap clothes cheap food or cheap whatever with all of these things everything there is a price there is not just the physical price in the store there is the cost the human toll price that is not quantifiable and there's the environmental price that is not quantifiable and right. we have seen the the impact of all of that as we've traveled around the world. We have seen the impact of environmental degradation oh, as we've sailed the oceans. Yeah, I've, you know, I, you've seen as well as I have to be thousands of miles from anything, from man, anything man-made. And there you see a large area, sometimes maybe only a few square feet, sometimes maybe hundreds of square feet of plastic and debris and garbage that have been thrown from ships that have been then uh, oh, wash down rivers, wash down wherever, and they're there, diluting and polluting and destroying our, our, our mother earth, and we've seen it. And people want to deny, oh no, that's just a local. No, it is worldwide, and it's something that we have to address because we're the only animals that foul our own nests. All the other animals clean their nests. We foul ours. And uh, what does that tell you about us as human beings? Yeah, we are below <laughs> some animals <laughs> in many ways. So, Bill, so, so you spent many years as captain of the, the tall ship, the Amistad. Right. And you serve there as ambassador. You are captain of the vessel, but you also were an ambassador. Well, it's yes, we, I got, uh, we got to go to a, a number of countries uh, in Europe. Uh, we went, well, in England, actually, uh, London, Liverpool, Bristol, all of those places that were involved in the slave trade. We also went to Portugal, uh, which was one of the first places to bring Africans out of Africa into the Americas for the purpose of slavery, 1441. I'll show you how early that started. And we went to Sierra Leone, the home of the captives of the Amistad, uh, which was an incredible situation. We came into Freetown, into the harbor where the African captives, after they won their court case, were freed and eventually came home. Of the 53 that started, 36 of them actually came back to West Africa, to Freetown, wow. to their home, their homeland. Making that return trip, making that whole cycle, being captured, released, and freed, never have, never having been slaves. And that was so important. The people there were just, just overjoyed that we were able to bring Amistad there. And the, we told, we tell the Amistad story, and it's still being told by the ship. That's the whole purpose, was to tell that story and to get people to start to think about what happened then, what happened then, now, and what's going to happen in the future unless we speak up and say something about it. And unfortunately in society, when good men are silent, evil shall prevail. Every time. Now, we've been talking sort of about our concerns uh, for our society. We've all become leaders in different ways. We have impacted, between you and I and our sailing, we've in impacted many, many people. With our success also came responsibilities. Certainly. And th that's part of the responsibility that even though I consider myself now as being retired, again, every time and every opportunity I get to tell the Amistad story. Every chance that, that I, I get a uh, young person our, writes to me uh, about my boys around the world, the first graders or high schoolers, uh, I try to do that. I have a young man now who I'm very, very proud of, a young man who came to me five years ago in high school and said, I want to be a captain. I said, okay, here's what you have to do. And I gave him 
well, everything he would have to do to make that a reality, he is now, he's graduating this May from Maine Maritime Academy. It's a great institution. It's a great school, and he's done it. Again, hopefully, he will carry on the thing that we've started, that concept of being able to take the maritime history into the history of the greater world, because the United States is a maritime nation. Everything comes in and goes out by ship. Yep. We are still part of that. And that, that is a heritage and a legacy that, that is so important. And people of color have been part of that legacy since the beginning of it. People don't know that. We want the people to know that. We want to see the, show the opportunity to young people of any nationality, of any race, that there is a life, there is a professional possibility at sea beyond our, the adventure that the we've pleasure, been doing, the pleasure, the pleasure of it. It is an industry. It is a career. I was sitting here next to a ferry dock. This dock, these ships that come in and out of here, these guys make very good. The mates, the uh, the captains, Captain, the deckhands, all of the people. It's it's an industry, and it's something that's available to all of them. Again, if they're willing to do what it needs to be done and hard take work, it. Yes. hard work, yes. commitment, drive, yes. focus. Those were the ingredients that got Paul and I to where we are today. So, Paul, one last thought, sort of, uh, as we look now to the future generations, we are both very, very concerned by how easy things have been made for this next generation. And we also are very aware, we both have served in the corporate arenas, and we are very aware that politically and economically, things are shifting, and shifting fast. Wealth is being transferred and being consolidated into the hands of a few. Yes, just a small percentage of people own the vast majority of wealth. And that's very frightening because, again, those who can control it control us, each one of us. And it takes a little bit of us away from us. It gives us less free will. It gives us, uh, again, uh, that what we're talking about, that economic slavery. Subtle though it may be, you're seeing it creeping in, creeping in, creeping in. One of the other things that, that I think that, uh, that we think about with, with technology and so many of the advances now is that young people are losing the ability to dream and imagine. Yes. And that is so important. If you dream and can imagine, all of the great inventions were made by some guy who was thought to be a nut. <laughs> or some dreamer. What are you, crazy? That will never work. But we're losing that. If it can't be punched into a computer, it doesn't people, exist anymore. That's it. And what also so sad, sort of uh, recently we were, uh, Darlene and I were on board El Gecko uh, in the, the British Virgin Islands. And there were a lot of charter boats, a lot of young people. And all I saw was this. Uh, they were sitting on their uh -huh. decks. They were not looking up. They were not looking at this amazing tropical waters. Beautiful. They were totally engaged only in the technology. And they were missing out. They were totally missing out on the environment. They had become slaves of their technology. They had become slaves of their wealth. And unfortunately, their education is suffering. Their global education, their broad perspective education, because they can't lift their head up. Yes, I, I, I had that. I had a, a charter uh, that I took out with... Uh, five adults and four children. Every single person on there, adult and child, had an electronic device. I came down from the flying bridge one day, and I'm looking. We are sitting in, in uh, Culebra here. Beautiful, every sunny day, great, beautiful surroundings. The best that nature has to offer. And every head, child from a five-year-old to the adults were all doing this playing games. Why We're bother, amusing ourselves why to death. leaving home? Yes, stay home. You don't need this. <laughs> Save it for those of us who can appreciate it. <laughs> Maybe it'll drive the price down. <laughs> <laughs> so, sort of, so yeah. well, sort of, uh, as, again, as you look to the future, are you hopeful? I'm always hopeful. I, I think if, if, I, if I lost hope, it would, it would be a, a disaster for me. We have to have hope, because that if someone didn't have hope, where would we be? Hope is the energy of change. Yeah. I Shall agree we with come that. over here and come and join Bill and I? Because here is here is my hope for the future. My granddaughter, who gets to sit here and to sail, and it's not every day you're going to get to sit with two sailing legends. 
with, uh, this is a piece of, 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 of history for, 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 for the sailing world. Bill and I sitting here on board our boat. Two people who should never have met in the world sitting on board our vessel here in the Caribbean and sharing our experiences, sharing our wisdom, sharing our knowledge and shall be ease our future generation. You are part of the next part of where the world can be. What have you learnt in this little time that you've been in the Caribbean uh, sailing with us? And being homeschooled. Not to give up on dream. And never give up. And never say never. <laughs> yep. That's it. And also, I'll tell you this. This is the, the title of my autobiography. Remember, it takes as long as it takes. So you just got to keep going until you get there. Bill? Thanks for being in my life. Thank thanks you. for being an inspiration to me. Thank you for being me. an inspiration and, to me. And, 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 Thank you. And, and, and thanks for continuing to do the things that makes our world a better place. And we can make a difference in our world. Yes. Never give up. That's it.